sighted moon. Our Messiah. Who goes to heaven when they die? Sister Teresa. <laughs> nobody. Who said nobody? Move to the front. Nobody has gone to heaven. But you go to the book of Revelation, you read in there, there are 24 elders in heaven. Look up the word elders. What's the word elders mean? Ancestors. Ancestors. Where are the ancestors? What are ancestors? Those are people who lived before us. Before us. How they get to heaven? There's only one explanation. That's the wave offering during the days of unleavened bread. The people who came out of the grave at that time ascended with Yeshua. These captives, captured by death, captured by Satan. What does Paul say? say? He led a host of captives with him. It doesn't say what their names are. Because Paul also said David is dead and with us to this day. Huge clue, and we're not going to talk about that one because you're not ready for it. <laughs> but you've got the books, you're going to find out soon enough. What? Oh, he hurts my brain. The wave sheaf is when these ancestors came out of the grave. Who they are, we don't know. Possibly Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because you only say the prayer. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you sort of assume they'd be saints. So they come out. They are now the 24 elders. Okay? That's what rep the wave offering is. What are you supposed to do from this wave offering? You count seven Sabbaths. And then after the seventh Sabbath is the 50th day. When is the Sabbath? It's the sixth day of the week. So when is the 50th day? I mean, what's the, uh, well, back up. Did you just hear what I just said? I heard what I just said, and I didn't like it, and you guys didn't say nothing. Yes, it's the seventh day, not the sixth day. I'm tired. The Sabbath is the seventh day. So the day after the Sabbath is? First day. It's the 50th day after the seventh Sabbath, correct? It's also the eighth day of the week, correct? Remember that, because this is huge in your understanding of the holy days. The Jews keep seven six, the sixth day of the third month, as Shavuot. They don't go after the seventh Sabbath, they just go after the first day of Passover and count 50 days. Is that correct? Oh, come on, is that correct? You're guessing, aren't you? <laughs> How do you know it's not correct? It says in Leviticus 23, after the seventh Sabbath is the 50th day. Right? I guess we're going to have to go over that a little bit later. We're just sort of touching on it right now. So then we have another wave offering. Two loaves. The house of Judah and the house of Ephraim. And they got sin in them. They're leaven. That's what leaven represents. And it's a wave offering. What does this represent? Joe doing his daily exercise. <laughs> the loaves represent you. You. But there's sin in it. It represents the wheat. He talks about the wheat and the tares. He talks about the wheat. We are to be that wheat. A large kernel that's useful. We're to be in that wave offering. When's that wave offering? Shavuot. When are we going to be raised up? Like the first people were raised up? Shavuot. And Paul says, the dead will rise first, and those of us who are alive at that time will be changed in the twinkling of an eye to meet them in the clouds and then come back down to the earth. That's why Shavuot is so important. That's why you want to be a part of it. This should answer all you people who used to believe in the rapture. And that's why people who don't keep the Sabbath and holy days can't understand it and do believe in the rapture. 
They just don't understand the Feast of Shavuot. Anyway, I'm bogged down. Time to get going again. So that's that. Then we do uh, and Pentecost. Okay, so and stop. Go back to Shavuot. There's something else I got to tell you. What happens on Shavuot? What's the first thing about Shavuot that we learned? Yes, but I only asked for the first thing. So now what's the second thing? <laughs> Correct. It's the giving of the law of Mount Sinai and the giving of the Holy Spirit in Acts. What does that mean? Two different things. No, it's the same thing. What is that? It's God's essence. It's what makes Jehovah Jehovah. His laws is, are who he is. His spirit emanates his laws. They're not two things. They're the same thing together. And that's what he wants to write in your heart. His spirit, his law of his kingdom on your heart. Then we have the Feast of Trumpets. This is the beginning of war. Or the call for supper. Not yet, Craig? Not yet. Okay. So it's the beginning of war. <laughs> Go back to that one. It's a memorial. It's a shouting. It's the day Yeshua was born. Then we have the tenth day, which is today. And we've talked about today. Today represents the day that Dinah is raped. The day that Tamar is raped. And the day that Israel is going to be raped. No, it's not today. But the understanding of those things explains why this nation of Malaysia is about to be raped. Give me some food. <laughs> Please. I'm sorry. Philippines. I have never been to Malaysia. I don't know why I keep saying that. Okay, so what was I talking about before I messed up again? Oh, the Philippines is going to be, Malaysia is going to be raped too. Why, why exclude them from all the pleasure? But not just them, not just you. The United States, Canada, England, Australia. The world is about to be raped. That's what today is telling you and teaching you through the curse of Balaam. You guys haven't figured out what I'm talking about yet. We're about to get there. Then we come to Sukkot. And Sukkot represents what? Say what? I'm sorry. The gathering of the nation. Okay, I'll take that, sort of. What else does it represent? The wedding. No. Ah, what's he saying now? Not the wedding. It's the wedding party. It goes on for seven days. Go back to Leviticus 19. Or Leviticus 17. Ah, lots of other places in Leviticus. A woman's unclean for seven days after she gives birth to a child. On the eighth day, she's clean. A boy. Her period, seven days. On the eighth day, she's okay. Impurity. Uncleanness. Seven days. Eighth day, you're clean. Right? We're going to talk about some of this stuff later as well. There's a lot of stuff I'm going to talk about. You just won't be able to shut me up. Seven days, seven days, seven days. And on the eighth day is the day that you can go back into the temple. Seven millennial days. I showed you the picture before. Seven millennial days. And then in the eighth day, what happens? You go to the book of Revelation. Okay, because the eighth day is the day of the wedding. The eighth day is the day of dedication. This is the Hanukkah that Yeshua was keeping in John 10, 22, on the eighth day of the feast, which is, I'll be talking to you about that when I come back next week, or in two weeks. It's the wedding. When Solomon dedicated the temple in 1 Kings, what happened? On the eighth day, go and read it. 
Jehovah came and dwelt with man in the temple and pushed the priest out because of his glory. Jehovah wants to dwell with you. And I can't figure out why you. Yeah, you and me, all of us. He wants to walk with us. He wants to talk with us. He wants to know why you're worried today. He wants to know what your concern, what your plans are. How big a, oh, I grow a big cabbage. How big a cabbage you're going to grow this year. He wants to know your, he just wants to talk to you. And he wants to walk with you. And that's what this eighth day represents. Because we read in Revelation that when he comes to live with you on earth, there is no more day or night. There is no more ninth day. Right? Have I said anything that's not true yet? I've said some things you may not have known, but they're all there in your Bible. Go and prove them. We're going to talk more about this later, I think, unless Ike changes my mind, gets me to talk about something else again. Then we come to verse 25. Right now we're only talking about the uh, Leviticus 25. We're only talking about the holy days. Here's another one, the sabbatical and jubilee years. And that's, you know, that's my thing. And somehow, because of the ignorance of most people, that's how I become the guy that's the authority on it in the world right now. And that's a shame. That's a darn shame. But after this week, you guys will now become authorities. Because it's not rocket science. It's so simple. I'm proof that it's simple. Because <laughs> I'm not really smart. And you'll find out by talking to me. He can't spell. So here's all the holy days. Oh, we got the top one chopped off. That says Leviticus 25, verse 2. Each and every one of them is there. The first numbers 1 to 13. That's okay. Don't worry about it. No, you're not going to change it. 1 to 13 are in your book, the 2016. Remembering the spell year of 2016. And I show you how to find them, how to prove them, where to find the proof. But the book is not about proving when, or discussing those so much. It's showing you when the curses come. Lately, since I wrote the book, I found all these tombstones. And these tombstones confirm those sabbatical years. And each and every one of those sabbatical years can be proven only by counting by seven from one to the next. If you count, say, 7 up, 701 BC, okay, so here it is. I didn't put this in my slides yet. I'm sorry, you told me twice now to do it. But you were talking to me last night. 2 Kings 19.29. Eat what grows of itself this year. Eat what grows of the same next year. And in the third year, plant and sow and harvest. That was the blessing that Jehovah gave to Hezekiah through Isaiah. And that's found in Isaiah 37, 2 Kings 19, 29, and 2 Chronicles 32. It's all talking about the same thing. That night, 185,000 Assyrians dropped dead. And Sennacherib went home without defeating Jerusalem. And he wrote about it. He says, I caged up Hezekiah like a bird in a gilded cage. But never says he conquered him. If it wasn't for that mention, we would never know when these events took place. 701 BC is the most undisputed date in history as far as your Bible is concerned. Because that is confirmed by the Limu list and the Emu list that the Assyrians documented all their kings and queens or all their kings and governors by throughout their kingdom from 9, what, 940, 967 BC down to the Babylonians being documented by Ptolemy. And that's documented down to 130, and then our history kicks in then, and we're able to have this chronology undisputed from that time. So all chronologists argue about chronology before 967, say 10,000 BC. So we know 701 BC. The only other day we have is the Battle of Karkar in 853 BC. Those two dates confirm when the Hebrew kings existed. We have no other proof that they were ever there other than your Bible. And we can't believe the Bible. Okay. You guys are tired too. I understand. So you count from 701 BC and you'll match every single date there. If you count by 50 from uh, 700 and then try and match up each one of these, not a single one will do it. So do this. Go home and do this. Uh, you've got this chart in your book, except for the uh, tombstones. Count by 700. That'll be 650, 600, 550, 500. 
then from there, you should be able to match up each one of these. You won't be able to do it because it doesn't work. It only works when you count by 7 from 701 BC, which is the 49th year, then every single one matches. Okay? That's one way of proving. Now, the tombstone we just found here uh, in the last two years, I've just discovered them. But they've been around for over 50 years. And they say things like, Hesediah, the daughter of Onel, the high priest, died in the third year of the fourth sabbatical cycle, 450 years, or 357 years after the temple was destroyed. And that is just awesome. Because first of all, they're found in the south of the Dead Sea in Jordan, outside the land of Israel. So they're keeping the sabbatical years outside the land of Israel, and they record them according to the temple. So now we know each and every one. And I've got, I have over 50 more that are in Hebrew that I haven't figured out yet. I have so many proofs of when the Sabbath and Jubilee years are that Jonathan Kahn should never even have tried to write a book. But after he heard about my book, he put his book to pen. And now he's being shamed because nothing he said came true. The sabbatical jubilee years are not about economics. They're about letting the land rest. Jonathan Kahn has perverted it into being about economic and stock market collapses. So we made a video two weeks ago, uh, three weeks ago in Pennsylvania, and we showed every economic collapse, every depression, every panic, every recession for the last 300 years. And then we showed you every sabbatical jubilee year according to this list when they were and you have a 50-50 coin flip of having it happen on a jubilee year, a sabbatical year, or before or after, or somewhere in between. Take a coin, flip it, and that's going to be a recession this year. Heads recession, tails not. That's how accurate these things are predicting stock market crashes. But Jonathan Kahn picked three that fit his theory and sold you all a bill of goods. How many of you bought the Shemitah? Ah, I did too. No, somebody said the scam. Pardon me? Somebody said the scam. 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 Yes. Yeah. No, true. Yes. Okay. So now, I got to explain the charts. Well, we're going to do that tomorrow. So basically what I did was I took all the sabbatical years and I put them on a Excel chart. 701 BC is followed by 700 BC. 700 BC is the first year and it's also the 50th year. 701 is the 49th. So each of these other years, 708, 715, 722, 729, 736, and 743 are sabbatical years. And you know that because you know when these other ones are. So I go from right to left to make you think. That's why I did it, to get you in the Hebrew mindset. So now, okay, that sun's getting closer, isn't it? I gotta hurry up. <laughs> so here's 456 and Nehemiah 818 is where it's mentioned. And there it is there, it's the 49th year. And the 50th year is 455. 162 and 134 BC are mentioned in 1 Maccabees and in Josephus Antiquities. And these are the two that all the other chronologists want to leave out because they don't fit their theory. These two prove to you that the sabbatical year begins in the month of Aviv. How do I know that? Because in 134 BC, uh, John Harkonnes is going to make revenge for the death of his brother and father. His mother is kidnapped. And he's taken over to, she and her another brother is taken over to Jericho, and she is beaten and raped in front of the whole Jewish army. Repeatedly. And John Harkonnes can't get to her. It's your mother on the wall being raped. What would you do? Anything I could to kill that guy. But he can't. He has a whole Jewish army there, and they can't, and they're watching this every day, every day. And it says in 1 Maccabees that John Harkonnes breaks off the siege against Jericho. 
and sends his army home, home and lets his mother be killed and his brother. Why did he do this? He didn't have the right reason. He misunderstood it. He did it because it says a sabbatical year was about to begin. This was the 11th month. So when does the sabbatical year begin? In the first month. When's the first month? The month of Passover. But this doesn't fit Rosh Hashanah, so we throw these out. No. You examine all the evidence and figure it out from that. Don't leave anything out. So there they are there. Here's the other ones that we have. And I'm going quickly. Remember, Julius Caesar is the best Jew of the world, right? Now, some of you got it. He's a Roman. But he recorded a sabbatical year. And here they are here, 43, 36, 22, 28, 56, 42 A.D. and 70 A.D. 31 A.D., Yeshua was killed. There was a blood moon the night before. Hmm. There were blood moons for the next 40 years from 31 up to 40, uh, 70 when the temple was destroyed. Out of those 40 years, there's 30 of them. I mentioned that in that video, and I think you all saw that video. So here we have the Bar Kopa revolt, and there are sabbatical years then. So, we already talked about this, 4950, when you come in the land. So now you, that's a chronology. We know the chronology coming down to our time now. Now we need to figure out the chronology from Adam forward. And when you add it all up, you'll end up at the Exodus taking place at 2500, I mean, uh, 2458 after creation of Adam. The entrance into the promised land in the year 2500. Leviticus 25.2 says, when you come into the land, the land shall have a rest. It's a jubilee year. Okay, I've gone quickly here, I know. I want to get to the point of why we afflict our souls. We are in the 120th jubilee cycle now, Genesis 6.3. We're at the year 2015. We have four blood moons. We've got two more dark moons coming in 2016. When we add this together, we know the chronology based on the Sabbath and Jubilee cycles, based on Genesis and our existing history. Again, we are near the end of the sixth millennial day, 2015. We suffer the curses now, and this is why the Philippines is being hurt. Leviticus 26:14. If you will not listen to me and will not do all these commandments, and if you shall despise my statutes, or if your soul hates my judgments, so that you will not do, man, somebody's cooking something that's driving me crazy. <laughs> so you will not, so that you break my covenant. J. Ace, I'm only kidding. Don't take me serious. <laughs> I will also do this to you. I will even appoint terror over you. This is the first curse. This is the first curse, and it starts in 1996 and goes to 2002. So what does that mean? In 1996, Osama bin Laden declared war in the United States. whoop de doo A lot of people say they hate the United States. Big deal. But in 1998, he blew up the uh, embassies in Tanzania and in Kenya, and suddenly moved from a nobody into a somebody wanted on, on the U.S. war list. Then we have the USS Cole being blown up in 2000 by a suicide bomber, Islamic suicide bomber. Then we have a bunch of Islamic men destroying the Twin Towers, 9-11. Again, I remember where I was and what I said that day. I thought somebody flew a Cessna into one of the buildings in New York. Then a half hour, hour later, I thought they flew another Cessna. And I thought, how can we have two stupid people doing that? And then I heard they shut down all the airplanes all over North America. That's when I realized something had just happened. And we shut down work, and then we went home, and we turned on the news. And we couldn't believe what we were seeing. The world changed September 11th. Doesn't that sound familiar? The day Yeshua was born. People are running for their lives. Scared to death. Thinking the Holocaust is coming. We have the Bali bombing. 
2002. Who did that? The J.I. Jemias Lamaya. I don't know who these guys are, but you do. You do. This is the first curse, and they're here in the Philippines. London, 2005, the bombings, subway bombings. 2006, Hezbollah starts to attack Israel. Right? Not too many people got killed at that time, but this is the thing that's most important about it. Hassan Nasrallah asked, when in any Arab-Israeli conflict were two million Israelis forced to flee or enter bomb shelters? When? Why is that so important? Leviticus 26, 17, part of this first curse. And I will set my face against you, and when you shall be slain before your enemies, and they that hate you shall reign over you. And you will flee when no one pursues you. The Philippines is not exempt from all this. You just buried 44 of your elite soldiers. This is home. This is not something that I'm talking about in the United States. It's happening here. I'm here to talk about the Philippines and about Torah and why you need to obey. It's happening here. J.I. is here. And they're not happy if you concede Mindanao to them. That's not going to solve the problem. Because they'll then want more and more and more and more until you concede the entire country to them. Until you are all wearing burqas or you're all sex slaves. One or the other, it doesn't matter to them. The second curse of Leviticus 26, 18. Again, this is affecting you, the Philippines. And if you will not yet listen to me for all this, and I will punish you seven times more for your sins. I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heaven like iron and your earth like bronze. What's that? Oh, that's climate change. That's, you know, the ozone changing. That's people causing pollution. Too many human beings breathing. Cars and carbon monoxide. Making the, the atmosphere harder for the sun to get back out. Those are the lies you're being told. These curses are coming from God, from Jehovah, because you are not obeying him and keeping his laws. How many of you kept the sabbatical year last time? How many of you kept the sabbatical year before that? How many of you kept the last jubilee year? We're all guilty. Again, the sun's about to go down. You need to repent of your sins. When you repent, that means you're going to turn around and keep the next one. The next Sabbath, the next Holy Day, the next sabbatical year, which is 2016. But the severe weather comes in the form of El Nino, typhoons, rain, flooding rains, two feet of rain in an hour, which you guys have all experienced. These things are here. Craig lives in Tornado Alley. There's nothing like a hundred tornadoes in a day there. It's nothing new. Yeah, it is. The third curse is pestilence. And if you walk contrary to me, I will cause, and, sorry, and if you walk contrary to me and will not listen to me, I will bring seven times more plagues than you according to your sins. I will send wild beasts among you. you who shall bereave you? That's not dogs, wild lions, uh, lions and tigers. It's ba ba bacteria, microbes causing disease, epidemics. Swine flu started in 2009. The Mexico airport was deserted. Oh, we didn't read, read the last part here. And make you few, and your highways shall be deserted. The biggest thing right now the World Health Organization is worried about is bird flu coming out of Asia. Bird flu. The United States, can, uh, McDonald's is having trouble right now supplying chicken to their restaurants because they're killing all their birds because of bird flu. But it doesn't make the news. The other thing that happens here in every calamity, people still go to the washroom and they go anywhere they have to. And that drinking water becomes polluted or stagnant and malaria increases and typhoid fever. You guys have done a good job of containing this after each disaster. You've had a lot of practice though. And that's a shame. 
We also have the blood moons warning us something. The blood moons warn of war. Okay, I'm going quickly now through the rest of this. Blood moons warn of war. We have blood moons in 2014 on the high holy days and blood moons on 2015. Monday is a Monday. Monday night, there's supposed to be a blood moon over Israel. You won't see it here, but I believe you will see what is called a dark moon. There are six dark moons mentioned in the Bible, only two blood moons. Yet everyone's all hyped up about the blood moon. Ooh. What about the dark moons? The dark moons warn of famine. What is the fourth curse? That's the black cycle there. When the moon passes through the shadow of the earth, directly in the shadow of the earth, the earth, the sun's rays are bent. And the red ones go right in that red dot. When the, earth, the moon passes through that, that's where you get a blood moon. But when the moon passes through the shadow of the earth, which is the other area there in the gray, it's called a dark moon. And a dark moon looks like this, dark yellow or brownish. It's a warning of famine. So you have in Genesis 6 a warning. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come and see. And another, a red horse went out and power was given to him sitting on it. The red horse, the horse of war. But what happened before that? We were told about a white horse. The white horse with a bow and a, a crown. Who's that? Many people are thinking it's Yeshua. Who is it? False religion. Why the bow and arrow? Nimrod was a hunter of men. Nimrod was the founder of all false religion. Ishmael was a hunter with a bow. Esau was a hunter with a bow. And Jeremiah tells you that after I come, the hunters are coming. Because I'm trying to win you over to Torah with my words. And if you don't take it, I walk away. But Ishmael is coming. Islam is coming. And it will force you to accept it. And if you don't, you're going to be raped. And if you don't, your men will be killed. The hunters are coming. They're already being assembled right now. Jehovah God raised up the Assyrians to take out Israel in 723 BC. He took out the apple of his eye. Jehovah God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, took out Judah in 586 BC with the Babylonians. In 70 AD, he raised up the Romans to take them out again. And do you think you're any more special than them, the apple of his eye? Even though you're grafted in, if you're not going to obey, he's going to take you out. And he's raising up the Islamic army now. False religion, followed by war, followed by pestilence or famine, which is what we've been talking about, the dark moon, and then death. War is coming, and it's racing here to the Philippines, as well as North America. Who's your biggest ally? Who's your most strongest military power? The United States. The United States is about to be defeated in this coming war that's about to come. And if you still think you're going to be raptured, you're not going to be raptured out. And I want you to think about that for a minute. In fact, I'm going to just rush ahead here real quick because I want to show you something. I want to ask you why these Yazida women were not raptured out. Why were they not raptured out? They are now being raped 30 times a day by every platoon or every jihadist that wants a Yazida to have sex with. Why weren't they raptured out? So everyone who believes in a rapture theory, you better answer this question for me and tell me why they were not raptured out. Why you are more special than they because you're sitting in the pew that you're sitting in, in the church that believes in the rapture theory, post, pre, or 
whatever, mid. Give me a break. These women are real women. They're the same as you. And they guys got caught and now they're being raped 30 times a day. A nine-year-old girl gets raped by a jihadist. And he's giving her to the next guy and the next guy and the next guy until her vagina is tore apart. Then they send her to the medics. And they sew her vagina back up and they ship her off to the slave market to sell her as a sex slave to the next bunch of guys that want her. These are the stories I'm reading coming out of Assyria now. That one came out one month ago. Don't bang your heads on the table. Don't hide your eyes. Look at this picture and look at your neighbor, the woman beside you. And you decide if they're going to be raptured out or not. This makes me mad. And I'm sorry. Because the next curse, Leviticus 26, verse 23. The fourth one. The black one. The fourth cycle. And if you will not be reformed by me by these things, but will still walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you, and I will punish you seven times more for your sins. And I will bring a sword against you. The sword of war is coming against you to execute the vengeance of God on you for not keeping the covenant. The covenant of Mount Sinai that we all say we keep but never do. How many of you keep the sabbatical years? Nobody does. How many of you keep the holy days? Very few. And now you guys are doing that here. And that's awesome. And I'm seeing lots of other people wanting to and keeping the Sabbath. And they don't have no one to teach them. And that's awesome. Because something's happening here. He's raising up people that are going to obey him. But they need teachers. They need you guys to stand up and teach. That man back there needs help to teach. And when you are gathered inside your cities, I will send the plague amongst you, and you shall be delivered into the enemy of your hand. Look at this picture. We're about to read a verse that you've been reading a long time, and I never knew what it meant until just recently. All these guys, all the men are executed. No questions, no debate, no jury. Oh, it might be a kangaroo court, but this. And if they find out you're a Christian, we got a special death for you. And if you fight us, we got something even more special for you. And you know what's coming next? You know what they used to do in the Middle Ages? They used to stick people on a stick and hold them up in the air, right through the rectum, out their head, alive, and leave them there until they die. That will come. You watch. And they take harems of women. Don't keep the Torah. I don't care. You get to choose how you'll die. Well, you'll get to choose whether or not you're going to die. You're going to die. But God will choose how. Verse 29. This is the fifth curse. Captivity. Verse 29, right at the bottom. And you shall eat the flesh of your sons and your daughters. It says it five times in the Bible, and people get mad at me, storm out here, close their eyes, I don't want to listen to him anymore. Read your Bible. Read what it says. It's coming. Famine is coming. Sighted Moon.